mock draft season. Hey! Welcome back to another episode of the Kev BK Beloved Show. Do not forget to like, follow, subscribe, rate five stars only. Come on, how you gonna rate less than five stars? Don't be a hater. Follow on all social platforms at BK Beloved. Okay, let's get into the mock draft. First overall pick on the clock, we got the Chicago Bears and surprise to absolutely nobody, Caleb Williams, quarterback at a USC. The best quarterback prospect in a decade is going to the best quarterback situation for a number one pick ever. I know that sounds lofty, but hear me out. The best quarterback prospect in the decade, I feel like that one's self-explanatory. How does Trevor Lawrence look right now? Exactly. And no one else in between 2014 and 2024 is even in that category. And before you say Patrick Mahomes, nobody thought Patrick Mahomes was going to be Patrick Mahomes before it started or else he would have been first overall. So let's not lie to ourselves here. And as far as the situation, was there ever a number one pick that went to that's going to a team that was 7-10 and 10 the last year? had the best defense in the league the second half of the season and added more pieces, just traded for a veteran number one wide receiver to go along with the number one wide receiver they already had from the year before and added a tight end and a receiving running back. There's still one or two pieces on the offensive line away from it being a perfect situation. Don't worry, we'll get there shortly. But hats off to Ryan Poles in the front office because he is doing what the last regime at the Bears did not do for Justin Fields, and that is giving Caleb Williams the best possible opportunity to succeed. And God damn it, I expect him to succeed. Number two overall pick, Washington Commanders are up and they're taking quarterback Jaden Daniels from LSU. I'll be honest, Washington's offseason moves do not move the needle for me at all. Short of trading away Terry McLaurin, it reminds me a lot of the Carolina Panthers offseason moves last year to surround Bryce Young. And I know that all the media outlets are praising the new Washington front office and their intuitive moves. And oh my God, look how smart they are. That's because Adam Peters is a media darling. And be very careful with these media darling GMs because they could fart and their friends in the media will tell you it smells like sunshine. This offensive line allowed their starting quarterback to be the most sacked quarterback in football last year. And to counteract that, they brought in the offensive guard, Nick Algeretti, who was the backup guard in Kansas City until Joe Tooney got hurt for the Super Bowl. And center Tyler DiBiase, I know that's probably not his name, but it sounds so much cooler when I say it like that, who played for the Cowboys who they were more than happy to let you overpay. And they still have no new tackles to speak of. That is the plan, to protect their quarterback, who might be 210 pounds soaking wet with two bricks in his pocket. Hopefully, Marcus Mariota is going to be taking a bunch of these hits until Jaden Daniels is just shoveling muscle milk down himself so he can get bigger. Because, ah, I don't know, this is not a great situation for the guy. Speaking of not great situations for rookie quarterbacks, the New England Patriots are up. Quarterback Drake May from North Carolina. On behalf of New England Patriots organization Fan City, I would like to apologize to Drake May and the entire Drake May family because they have failed your son miserably. Outside of quarterback, the Patriots came into this offseason with two main needs. Wide receiver one, left tackle. They went 0 for 2 with multiple opportunities. And every big free agent target, what was the story every single time, Pats fan? The Patriots were interested. Just for Kraft, Mayo, and Elliot Wolf to come out of the meetings and be like, well, you know, we were more focused on building depth in a long-term view. Shut the hell up. We have your interviews. Stop it. And I'm just like, so nobody in this front office watched the Panthers last year. Nobody. Apparently nobody did. But Drake May should sit for a year and develop anyways. He has some mechanical and decision-making issues that he needs to clean up that hopefully will take the whole year to fix for his own safety. So maybe Jacoby Brissett will get his head kicked in all next year while Drake May holds the clipboard to his chest and learns how to play the NFL game. And hey, maybe we'll get another top five pick next year and we'll fuck that one up too. Yay. God, I miss Bill Belichick. Number four, the Arizona Cardinals will not be trading their pick because they'll be drafting wide receiver Marvin Harrison Jr., the best wide receiver prospect since Calvin Johnson, unless you think it's Jamar Chase, will reevaluate that one in a year. Versus man coverage since 2022, Marvin Harrison Jr. has 82 receptions, first in the country, 1,608 yards, first in the country, 24 receiving touchdowns, first in the country, 71 first downs, first in the country, and a 95.3 receiving grade according to PFF, and you guessed it, first in the country. Fuck your pro day. Fuck your combine. Fuck your press conferences. Who cares? 
We've known he's the best receiver in this draft for about two years now. Nothing that would have happened this draft process would have changed that. So him not doing anything in his draft process also didn't change that. He'll be fine. Just turn the film on. And if you're peeing, change up. We got our first trade of the night. The Minnesota Vikings will be trading pick 11 and 22 to the Los Angeles Chargers for the fifth overall pick. And they'll be drafting quarterback J.J. McCarthy for Michigan. I have conceded. I have conceded that J.J. McCarthy will be the fourth quarterback off the board. My opinion of him, however, has not changed. I simply do not see what y'all see. I just don't. I've spent hours trying to understand it. I went to the two people I trust the most with quarterback evals, Quincy Avery and JT O'Sullivan, aka QB Takeover and the QB School. Even they're confused. Obviously, I'm not wishing ill will on JJ. I wish him all the best. I don't even know him enough to wish him ill will. He didn't do shit to me. And for his sake, shit, maybe I'll be wrong. There's a reason I'm not in the NFL front office. Maybe I'll be wrong. He'll play 15 years, win multiple MVPs, Super Bowls, blah, blah, blah. But I just don't see it. And that's fine. If the Vikings like it, I love it. Number six, we got the New York Giants, and they'll be taking wide receiver Roma Dunze from Washington. The Giants addressed their O-line needs in free agency, literally signed a player at every single position. Like, not even joking. They signed two new tackles, two new guards, and a new center. Evan Neal might also be moving the guard, which please do because right tackle is not for you, my brother. And they need receiver help in the worst way. Sterling Shepard, Paris Campbell, and Saquon Barkley are all out the door. I know they took Jalen Hyatt last year in like the third or fourth round, but Daniel Jones has to throw to somebody as a wide receiver. One, Darren Wilder ain't getting any younger. And between Odunze and Neighbors, I have always said it is a toss-up. It is going to depend on fit between who is drafting the receiver. I think Odunze is a better fit for the Giants. Daniel Jones isn't exactly an aired out guy. He's not trying to heave the ball down the field at all costs. And thank God, because his pick total might triple if that happened. Nor is he very accurate. So making the route runner extraordinaire, large catch radius, Roma Dunze, the perfect fit for the Giants. Number seven overall, we got the Tennessee Titans, and they'll be taking Joe Alt, left tackle from Notre Dame. The Titans have done everything in their power to make sure that Will Levis is successful next year. I respect it. Strengthen the defense? Check. Bring in a veteran wide receiver one? Check. And now drafting Joe Alt, secure the offensive line? Check. Joe Alt was already going to be a day one starter and had potential all pro written all over him. But now you get him coached up by the Callahans? Oh my God. <laughs> Oh my God, he's going to be an issue day one. Number eight overall, the Atlanta Falcons will be taking edge rusher Dallas Turner from Alabama. I had the Falcons trading away this pick in my last mock draft because I thought they were going to need to get there. We just traded for Justin Fields draft compensation back. But instead, they signed Kirk Cousins and they bought in Darno Mooney and Rondo Moore to strengthen their receiving core. But you know what they didn't do? A goddamn thing for their defense. I shit you not, as I'm recording this right now, they have not signed a single defensive player. And Raheem Morris, being the defensive coach that he is, is going to want some defensive players, especially when he saw what Kobe Turner for the Rams was able to do last year. He was like, what, a fourth, fifth round pick? You give him Dallas Turner after the combine he just had where he put on a show and all that combine shit. I know a lot of it is show muscles and whatnot. Not for Dallas. All of it shows up on film. You put him on the other side of Calais Campbell. So he has a nice vet to learn from. Grady Jarrett's already been quietly one of the best D tackles in football. Dallas Turner is going to be the runaway favorite to be rookie of the year next year. I can't wait to see this one. And, oh, sheesh. Another pick into the first round. Las Vegas Raiders are trading with the Chicago Bears, switching from pick number 13 to pick number 9, and they'll be drafting quarterback Michael Penix Jr. The Raiders still have to trade up to get the quarterback of their choice. They have to jump the Broncos so they can have their choice between Michael Penix and another quarterback who will be coming up later. And I have just always thought Michael Penix was the best fit for this team, and you will not talk me out of him not being a top 15 pick. You just won't. Roma Dunze's biggest comp has always been Devontae Adams, right? Well, Michael Penix, how would you like to throw to the original version? Who people try to say Devontae Adams wash, you have Aiden O'Connell and Jimmy Garoppolo throwing you the ball all year long, and you tell me how you like it. Plus, I made this point last mock draft, so I'll just go ahead and repeat it again. Guys, we're overthinking this Michael Penix thing. 
We have been scratching and hoping for other quarterbacks to show on film what Michael Penix has shown week after week all year long. He makes pre and post snaps reads better than everybody in the draft. He is a ball placement specialist with Hawkeye level accuracy. The injury issue should not be a concern because he did not miss a single snap at Washington. And if you're Vegas, you draft the older quarterback because bringing in a 21 year old to be the star in Las Vegas after you done had 30,000 players get arrested in your time there, not a great idea bring in the adult next up we have the new york jets and they're taking tight end brock bowers from georgia they could have won a lot of different ideas here the jets fulfilled their needs at tackle and receiver kind of in the in free agency they both got tyler smith and michael williams both on one-year deals and they both aren't the pinnacles of health and they're playing on the met life turf so if they have self-awareness maybe they'll get a go tackle or receiver here but here's what we're forgetting aaron Rodgers hates young wide receivers hates them despises them almost as much as he hates vaccines which would leave tackle but this is as deep as the tackle class we're gonna see so they can fill that need later you know where this draft isn't deep at tight ends and if you let the draft people tell it brock bowers isn't a tight end he's a receiving entity whatever the hell that means so bring in your receiving entity for aaron Rodgers to throw to and go ahead ball out that's concludes top 10 picks we're gonna take a quick break, come right back, and we're gonna do picks 11 through 20. And we're back, gonna do picks 11 through 20, but before we get there, I wanna run you back through picks one through 10. Chicago Bears went Caleb Williams, Washington Commanders went Jaden Daniels, New England Patriots went Drake May, Arizona Cardinals, Marvin Harrison Jr., Minnesota Vikings traded up with the Chargers to get J.J. McCarthy, Giants went Roma Dunze, Tennessee Titans, Joe Alt, Atlanta Falcons went edge rusher Dallas Turner. Las Vegas Raiders went quarterback Michael Penix when they traded up with the Bears. And the New York Jets went tight end Brock Bowers. Let's go ahead and get it started. Uh, the Chargers traded back to the number 11 pick, and they end up getting a wide receiver anyways. Malik Neighbors, LSU. Now, I know there's some skepticism whether the Chargers are going to draft the receiver or not because they drafted the one top of the draft last year. But considering everybody from the last regime is now fired, I don't think that's going to weigh into effect that much. Plus, they either traded away or released Justin Herbert's three most targeted receivers last year. And Austin Eckler, but still. This man has to throw to somebody. And Malik Neighbors is going to be able to benefit from Justin Herbert's big arm in the off chance that Greg Roman actually lets him throw a ball downfield. Even though an offensive lineman is going to be calling Jim Harbaugh's name like the Green Goblin mask, I think Malik Neighbors is a no-brainer here. At the number 12 overall pick, the first new entry into Mock Draft 2.0, the Denver Broncos will be taking quarterback Bo Nix from Oregon. I'm still 50-50 on Bo Nix, I'm not going to lie. This is way more of a need pick than a value pick here's the good you could call bo nix a system qb but if he is he's one of the most efficient system qbs we've ever seen his efficiency numbers are off the goddamn charts like otherworldly good the type of efficiency that gives sean payton wet dreams at night it is a type of execution of a quarterback that knows his system front and back and has seen every single defense the country has to offer against him and therein lies the bad bo nix started 61 games in college more than every other quarterback in ncaa history and silly me the 34 that he started at Auburn where he didn't look super efficient is hard for me to get out of my brain. And it looked like he had a better chance of getting drafted to go fight in Iraq than he would have getting drafted to the NFL at the time. But I do like the fit between him and Sean Payton if we're getting Oregon version Bo Nix. Although I really wish y'all would stop comparing Bo Nix to Drew Brees. Drew, Drew Brees, one of the best quarterbacks to ever live. Like, can we stop? There is no next Drew Brees. Let's stop. Next up, we got the Chicago Bears who traded back with the Las Vegas Raiders. At pick number 13, they are taking offensive tackle Olu Fashanu from Penn State. The Bears have done everything they can to surround Caleb Williams with talent except protect his blind side. I know they drafted Darnell Wright last year. He is a right tackle. He is not a left tackle. He's going to stay there. Olu Fashanu is the best pass blocking tackle in this draft. Joe Alt is better overall. I think Olu is a better pass blocker just as a high end skill. And they played together in high school, so they go together like a hand in a glove. 
And now you can use the additional picture this guy from the Raiders and whatever you have left from the Panthers to double down and fill whatever other needs you have because you already filled needs one and two. Number 14, we got the New Orleans Saints, and they'll be taking offensive tackle J.C. Lathan from Alabama. If you can't get rid of Derek Carr, God damn it, you might as well protect him. Last season, I saw a man absolutely terrified of getting hit in the pocket. And you have to alleviate that issue some way, somehow, if you want to have success, especially since the Kirk Cousins addition to the Falcons makes them look like contenders and the far and away favorite to win that division at least. And J.C. Lathan more than fills the hole that Cameron Irvin and Andrews Pettit left because they didn't resign them because they can't because they're in cap hell. Number 15, we have the Indianapolis Colts and they will be taking cornerback Quinion Mitchell from Toledo. I don't think I've ever seen someone have a greater draft process than Quinion Mitchell. For anyone who ever says that the draft process will never matter again or it's never going to die, I'm even on the side of for top, top prospects, it doesn't matter. For people like Quinion, yes, the hell it does. He answered all the questions. Can he play against higher level competition? Damn right he can. He was the best player at the Senior Bowl. Locked every receiver up. Does he have NFL athleticism? Yes, sir. 4'3", 340, and a 38 inch vertical. Combine that with a six foot, 200 pound frame? That sounds like an NFL corner to me. Number 16 overall pick, the Seattle Seahawks will be taking edge rusher Liatsu Latsu from UCLA. The Seahawks have not been able to consistently rush their passer, essentially since the Legion of Boom era ended. And this off season, they, hold on. To fix it, they did jack shit. Nada. Not a damn thing. So they draft the best pure pass rusher in this class. If you love trench warfare the way I do, watching lots who rush the passer is damn near Oscar worthy film. He has all the moves already. His hand usage, his hand, it's so good already. Last two seasons since coming back from medical uh, retirement. 23 and a half sacks, 34 uh, tackles for loss, and 85 total tackles. He plays at 270-ish and looks significantly more athletic than he did in any of the combine drills. He is a gamer, and he's going to be a day one impact guy, especially with Mike McDonald calling up that defense. Oh, boy. 17 overall, we got the Jacksonville Jaguars, who will be taking Talese Fuaga from Oregon State. Last season, the injuries Trevor Lawrence suffers are as follows. Week 6 versus the Colts, he had a left knee bruise. Week 13 versus the Bengals, he had a high ankle sprain. That was the why is there no cart game. 15 versus the Ravens, he had a concussion. Week 16 versus the Buccaneers, he had a shoulder AC joint sprain into his throwing shoulder where he had a torn labrum on, I think it was four years ago. This man is in line to get a $280 million contract probably in the next six months. Keeping him upright is priority one through 10 for the Jacksonville Jaguars, or at least it should be. So putting a 334 pound super athlete that packs a punch and pass pro, damn good idea. Bring in Fuaga. Number 18 overall, we got the Cincinnati Bengals and they'll be taking wide receiver Brian Thomas Jr. from LSU. I think that T Higgins situation is going to hell. I don't see any situation where he ends up in a Bengals uniform come the fall. Hell, he might not be in one by the by the end of day one of the draft. Do the Bengals have bigger areas of need? Maybe. But with Tyler Boyd and T. Higgins out the door, you got to fill that need. And taking the best receiver available, Brian Thomas, fills that need in a big way. And the LSU connection, obviously. Los Angeles Rams up next at 19 overall. They'll be taking Jerzon Newton, defensive tackle from Illinois. Aaron Donald's out and retired. Congratulations on an amazing career. Let's bring in another quote-unquote undersized defensive tackle. Obviously, Jerzon is not Aaron Donald, and he may never be. Some people don't even think he's DT1, but I think those people are smoking penis. He is a rare combo of defensive tackle that's equally good at shooting gaps as he is at absolutely depleting guards in front of him. He's probably going to move to more of a 3, 4-I, 5-technique type player, or all three, when it comes into the NFL. He's a He's kind of small to play in the one unless he gets significantly stronger. But regardless, the kid is a problem. Watch the Wisconsin game and the Kansas game and you'll see it instantly. I don't give a damn that they lost. He didn't. At number 20, the Pittsburgh Steelers will be drafting wide receiver Adonai Mitchell from Texas. After trading for Justin Fields and signing Russell Wilson, the Steelers receiving room is as follows. George Pickens, Van Jefferson, Calvin Austin, Denzel Mims, Quez Watkins, and Cordell Patterson. It smells crazy in that room. 
And that's even after they traded Deontay Johnson, who stinks in his own right. There are other receivers that could have won here, but I think Adonai is the best fit. Some people have Keon Coleman from Florida State graded higher, but he fills the same role that George Pickens does, and I don't think there's a need for that much overlap. So you bring in Adonai, get a little fire and ice going in the receiver room, and let's make some magic. Hopefully Arthur Smith doesn't fuck it up this time. Pick number 21, we got the Miami Dolphins, and they'll be taking center slash guard Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon, offensive guard Robert Hunt, and center Connor Williams are both out the door. As it looks right now, the tackles are secure with Isaiah Wynn and uh, Teron Armstead's coming back, and they're bringing in Jack O'Driscoll as a third tackle, which, when you're a team that has injury issues like the Dolphins, pretty damn good idea to have a third tackle. Plus, you have a quarterback that's a little bit on the short side, so bringing in a center to secure the interior, great idea. So bringing in Jackson Powers Johnson, who is far and away the best interior offensive lineman in the draft, it, it's a perfect fit. He'll probably start off at guard considering Dolphins gave their uh, backup center, whose name escapes me at the moment, a pretty sizable deal. I think it was three years, 21 million. But it would not surprise me in the slightest if he wins that job in training camp. He's that good. And there's a lot of overlap in the Oregon offense and the Dolphins offense. It's a lot of RPO. It's a lot of zone scheme, a lot of counters, a lot of duos, a lot of outside zone. It's a lot of overlap. And he brings a level of physicality that the Dolphins desperately need. He's not going to end up looking scared in a negative degree weather game. He lives for it. Number 22, we got the Philadelphia Eagles, and they'll be taking Tyrion Arnold from Alabama. A lot of people were down on Tyrion because of he ran a 4 5 40, but I'm watching the film confused as to what player y'all been watching because that's about what I expected him to run. What world did y'all think he was a 4 3 type corner? His only crime is that he has not had as great of a draft process as Quinion Mitchell. And as I stated before, nobody has. He just so happens to play the same position that Quinion does. He's still a damn good player and is just as good as a player as you thought he was when the draft process started. The Eagles need him bad. That pass defense was Basuda the second half of the season. Bradbury cannot be cornerback two anymore. Darius Slay is not getting any younger, and that Ringo pick is not off to a great start. So best case scenario, if Ringo turns out good, you have a cornerback duo that's going to last. Duos don't last 10 years in the league anymore, so let's call it the next four to five years. Worst case scenario, Taron Arnold ends up taking over for Slay at that cornerback one spot. You can worry about cornerback two later. Win-win. Pick 23 in a trade with the Minnesota Vikings, the Los Angeles Chargers take offensive tackle Amarius Mims from Georgia. 6'8", 340, runs damn near a 5 flat 40. An absolute unit. You put him in Greg Roman's offense and dear God, that psycho might make Amarius Mims pull on some occasions and God help the poor linebacker that ends up in his way. The Chargers might restore the feeling with this pick because linebackers are like 220 now because they got to cover tight ends and whatnot. You might want to put your D-tackle at linebacker that game if you got him coming your way. Pick number 24, the Dallas Cowboys will be taking offensive guard slash offensive tackle Troy Fontenu from Washington. The Cowboys let their Hall of Fame left tackle go to the Jets for reasons that still remain unclear. There are people that think that Troy will have a better career at guard than he will at tackle. I just flatly disagree. He has the side and fluidity to be a starting tackle in the league and a damn good one, mainly because he was a starting tackle for probably the best offensive line that wasn't Michigan. And even if he would be better at guard, let's play the experiment now. Tyler Smith, who already is an all-pro level guard that plays for the Cowboys, he might move to left tackle. Someone has to play guard. And right guards filled up by future Hall of Famer Zach Martin win-win draft Troy Fontenot number 25 we got the Green Bay Packers and they'll be taking Jared Verse from Florida State now the Green Bay Packers could go corner here but there are no corners who give you the value that Jared Verse does here before the season he was projected to be a top five pick there are some people who still think he's the best edge rusher in this draft and they might not be wrong the Packers would be more than happy to grab him at pick 25 and you know what makes all your DBs look better a damn good pass rush and Jared Verse plays the part Pick number 26, we got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and they'll be taking cornerback Cooper DeGene. And will Cooper DeGene be a corner? Will he be a safety? Will he be a nickel corner? Is it reverse racism? Well, none of that's going to matter because if he goes to Tampa Bay, he's going to play all of it because Todd Bowles is sick in the head, and he's going to move him everywhere. Hell, he might play linebacker. But since the Buccaneers did trade away Carlson Davis for a bag of chips and a leather wallet, 
they're going to need a new corner. So he might end up playing mostly corner. Who knows? Cooper DeGene. Tampa Bay Bucks. Pick number 27, we got the Arizona Cardinals, and they'll be taking edge rusher Chop Robinson from Penn State. If the Cardinals leave day one of this draft with a generational wide receiver, and now this super athlete coming off the edge, just start writing the A-plus draft grade articles now. A team that was bottom three in, in sacks last year, bringing a kid with all the physical tools to be a high-end productive pass rusher in the NFL, probably not immediately, but in two, three years, could be one of the best players in the league. He has that much potential. He was so good at Penn State that Michigan flat out abandoned passing the football because their tackles had zero answers for Chop Robinson. They just said, fuck it. We can't keep him away from J.J. McCarthy. And J.J. was like 180 at the time. So they're like, hey, so J.J. doesn't die. We're going to run the football for the rest of the second half. I feel like that speaks for itself. Pick number 28, we got the Buffalo Bills, and they'll be taking wide receiver Keon Coleman, Florida State. This is one of the few picks from Mach 1.0 that are the exact same. And this is before Gabe Davis signed with the Jaguars that I had this year. So I'll just copy and paste what I said last time. Josh Allen finally gets a receiver that can look him in the eyes and can high point all the YOLO balls that he loves to throw so goddamn much. I've been doing wide receiver evolves since the beginning of the season. Keon was one of the first ones. I've yet to see a corner successfully press him. Maybe they have. I watched it again since I did Mach 1.0. No, no, they have not. I've seen people knock his route running and he's not that fast because of the 40 time and blah, blah, blah. Hey, bro, I watched a lot of him. He is not a 4'6 on the field. Let me tell you. And as far as the route tree critiques, okay, if I can out jump everybody, who gives a shit about my route tree? Throw it up. Who cares? And when you have a quarterback as erratic as Josh Allen, getting somebody with as large a catch radius as possible, probably a good idea. Pick number 29, we got Nate Wiggins from Clemson. And I know they just traded for Carlton Davis. And coincidentally, I, I had this pick before they released Cam Sutton, which happened maybe five minutes before I started recording. And we all saw the Rams game, right? They definitely need more than one corner, especially if you can get a shutdown corner the level of Nate Wiggins at 29. Nate Wiggins went to Indy and posted a 4.2840. The video of his teammates responding to his 40 time was incredible. Love that video. And he's just as fast on film. Rarely ever gets beat deep in a straight line. His recovery ability is high end. He baits quarterbacks sometimes to his own detriment because he can get tricked every now and again, but that that's young nigga, young player stuff. He'll get better. He's a little boomer bust, but in straight up press coverage technique, it's teach tape. Just don't ask him to run support because at 170 to 180 pounds, he's not your guy. But shut down corner, he's the man for the job. And, and if he's drafted to the line, something tells me he spends a month or two around Dan Campbell. He gonna learn to tackle. Number 30, we got the Baltimore Ravens. They'll be taking offensive tackle Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma. Another repeat pick for mock draft 1.0. The Ravens already had issue at offensive line, specifically right tackle, and they rectified it by sending Morgan Moses over to the Jets. You bring in Tyler Guyton, who has high-end upside potential to be the best tackle in the draft in three to four years. There's some clunky scheme fit stuff here that rings some alarms, but that's more so technique than he's just not capable of it. I still like it overall, and he's definitely best tackle available. Pick number 31, ladies and gentlemen, the steal of the draft, Byron Murphy the second from Texas. Armstead, Sebastian Joseph, Jared Kinlaw, Chase Young, and pretty much the whole D-line not named Nick Bosa is out the door. Or Javon Hargrave. So you bring in the menace from DeSoto, Texas. Last pick of the first round, we got the Kansas City Chiefs drafting wide receiver Troy Franklin from Oregon. There was about four different wide receivers in this spot. The closest I consider was Xavier Worthy, but Adonai Mitchell was the match before, and Troy Franklin is a much better one-to-one -one fit there. He has the elite speed. He's a precision route runner at his size. Great releases for a lengthy wide receiver is pretty damn good after the catch. Sometimes on film, I got confused by this. His deep ball tracking skills looked off, but I came to the conclusion that probably had more to do with Bo Nix's inconsistent deep ball than it did him track his tracking skills. You know what will fix that? Going to play with the quarterback who's probably the best deep ball passer to the league has ever seen. All right, quick break. And I wanted to switch up the format just a little bit this week. If you want to ask me why, no other reason but boredom. I have no better reason. 
And also, there's a lot of topics I want to start fitting in more, but I don't want to spend a bunch of time on them. But I got me a nice little, nice little six-ish piece that I want to get started on the show. The goal is to do this in six and a half minutes. The maximum is 10, which means it'll end up being about 15. Ready? Let's begin. March Madness recap. I spent damn near every second from Friday until literally Monday night watching Women's March Madness nonstop. The stars were starring from Paige Beckers to Juju Watkins to Kaylin Clark to Kiki F. Reed and to just stars everywhere playing their asses off. South Carolina just dominating everyone. And I want to do a full-blown recap and preview the rest of the tournament, but this is where I get to get full transparent. The goal was to invite someone who covers women's basketball in a lot more depth than I do onto the show. Here's what happened. I reached out to about six different analysts and reporters that worked at various outlets, different levels or whatever. But here's what actually came out and how I took the interpretation of it, which was, hey, complete stranger. I know it's the busiest time of your year, but would you like to come on to this unknown podcast to talk about the sport that's way more important to you? And that went about the way you expected it. So I'm a, we're going to still try to reach out to people, <laughs> see who else can come on. If you cover women's basketball and would like to hop on a show and kick it with me, come on, come kick it with me. But I do want to bring up this one quick point that I've been talking about pretty frequently about the growth of women's basketball. And that's the way that New oncoming fans that mostly cover men's sports are going to have to adjust their game and how they talk about women's sports. Prime example, I won't put the gentleman who put this tweet out on blast. It's not really necessary, but he was comparing Paige Beckers to Caitlin Clark, and he said something to the effect of Paige Beckers was supposed to be Caitlin Clark before Caitlin Clark. And oh boy, did the old guard hardcore women's basketball fans kick that man's head in. And to an extent, he deserved it. But I kind of get what he was trying to say. (laughs) I feel him. I'm going to see if I could say it with a little more coop. Kalen Clark and Paige Beckers are the same uh, high school recruiting class, right? They're both class of, I believe it's 2020 or 2019, one of the two. Paige Beckers was obviously the number one recruit. She won National Player of the Year as a freshman. She was going to be the star of all stars in women's basketball. She goes to UConn, which is the dominant program in women's basketball, right? But during Kaitlyn Clark's ascension last year, Paige Beckers was hurt. You see what I'm saying? So I get what he was trying to say. He mostly covers college football. He's a writer for a large publication. Again, I don't want to put him out. I don't want to put him out there, but that's how we talk about sports when we're talking about male sports i understand that don't put two women against each other and there could be more than one women's star once and this is the problem i feel you i swear i do but we've been having jordan versus lebron debates for a decade plus at least now we compare male players all the time every single day Turn on ESPN right now. I promise you they're comparing some players against each other. And as the women's game begins to grow, there's going to be a lot more sentiments like that. Is there a way that he could have handled it better? Of course. But it's going to take a while for adjustments on both sides to be made. But for now, I'll conclude the women's recap with this. What an outstanding weekend of women's college basketball. I genuinely feel sorry for you if you do not get to enjoy this and watch this. If your misogyny or hatred or whatever gets in your way of enjoying this sport stops you from watching these incredible games, these incredible women, these incredible athletes, the joke's on you, buddy. You're costing yourself because I had a ball all weekend long and I will continue to have a ball throughout the rest of the tournament and the Sweet 16. Next topic, we're going to try to go positive, negative, positive, negative, and see if we can go from there. Sean P. Diddy Combs is in some shit again. We're going to put allegedly, allegedly, allegedly all over this conversation because he likes to sue people. So according to TMZ, all these stories, the Department of Homeland Security raided two of Diddy's houses at once, (laughs) the one in Los Angeles and the one in Miami. Since then, he had been the him and his plane have been detained at the Miami airport 
an alleged drug mule was arrested at his house that apparently used to play basketball for Syracuse, Brendan Paul. I, I don't know. Some some white boy that is about to sing like Brian McKnight in that room, boy. Let me tell you. Ridley Scott was mad because the raid stopped them from getting into his house. There's a lot going on the Diddy case. And I had a segment I did on Diddy when the Cassie uh, lawsuit first happened. And I'll repeat what I said there. Sean P. Diddy Combs is allegedly a abusive piece of shit. And if he is found guilty on these charges, especially now that more sex trafficking is involved, he deserves to rot in jail and then burn in hell. There's no if, ands, or buts about that with me. <laughs> like, I don't get why that's so hard for people to say. And I genuinely get tired of the whole teppy protect black men crowd because you only seem to come out when you're protecting black men that have done bullshit. And usually it's bullshit that have happened when women are the victims specifically black ones i can't rock with you brother I i'm not gonna rock with you and quite frankly you deserve to burn the hell right on with them i don't give a damn how good you can dance sing produce beats how good your liquor is i don't care if you are an abusive piece of shit burn burn black white purple polka dot i don't care next up kim mulkey I wanted to get much deeper on this one, but the Washington Post did not leak the story yet. For y'all that missed it, Kim Mulkey, after the, whatever their round of 64 game was, where they beat the crap out of a team, she put out a pre-statement before Washington Post story even came out. Apparently, they've been doing investigative journalism about her for two years, interviewing former players, staffers, media members that used to work with her, and she calls it a hit piece before it even came out, and I know for a fact she hasn't read it yet because that's not how journalism works. And I have never seen a pre-statement backfire on somebody so badly in my life because the entire journalism community that would have been covering this story, any goodwill she might have had, burned it to the ground. <laughs> so before the story even came out, she's automatically presumed guilty when she could have just shut the fuck up. Kim Mulkey, you could have said nothing. You could have said nothing, waited for the story to come out and then release that very same statement. I promise you it would have been perceived differently. I promise you it would have, but now we'll never know. Next topic, the NFL got to make some rule changes. First up, they banned hip drop tackles, which was a word that didn't exist in football lexicon until a year ago. But the exact rule is as follows. This is straight off of NFL.com. Article 18, the hip drop tackle. It is a foul if a player uses the following technique to bring a runner to the ground. A, grabs the runner with both hands or wraps the runner with both arms. And B, unweights himself by swiveling or dropping his hips and or lower body, landing on or trapping the runner's legs at or below the knees. And hopefully, as I'm saying that, I didn't get lazy editing this later for the video people watching this, and you can see the examples that the NFL used as they were displaying these rules. And a lot of people are up in arms because you're making playing defense even harder. And I wanted to uh, bring up this point about the competition committee that votes on these rules, right? So there's two committees. There's an executive committee, and there's a competition committee. The, comp the executive committee includes one representative an owner or a top officer from each of the league's 32 teams, right? The competition committee consists of Rich McKay, the CEO of the Falcons, Katie Blackburn, the executive vice president of the Bengals, Chris Greer, general manager of the Miami Dolphins, Stephen Jones, COO of the Dallas Cowboys, also known as Jerry Jones' son, John Mara, president, CEO, and owner of the New York Giants, Sean McDermott, head coach of the Buffalo Bills, Sean McVay, head coach of the Los Angeles Rams, and Mike Tomlin, head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers. You know what none of those people I just named were? Players. The people who actually have to abide by these rules. And that's the problem right there. What the hell is the point of the NFLPA if the committee that passes the rules that you have to abide by, there are no players in that room? What the hell do you have a union for? If the people that decide the rules of your employment, you don't have a say in it. What are we doing? Another rule that was passed is they changed kickoffs again. And I I barely even know how to explain this one. So I'll just take the word straight from Tom Pelissero. 
The pass kickoff rule features new alignments for both the kicking and receiving units, a quote-unquote landing zone, the area between the receiving team's goal line and its 20-yard line, would prompt action off the kickoff if the ball were to land in that sector. Kickoff will remain at the 35-yard line, but remaining 10 players on the kick unit will line up at the opposing team's 40. The receiving team lines up at least seven players in the setup zone, a five-yard area between their 35 and 30-yard lines, with a maximum of two returners can line up in the landing zone. After the ball is kicked, the kicker cannot cross the 50-yard line, and the 10 kicking team players cannot move until the ball hits the ground or a player in the landing zone or goes into the end zone. The receiving team players in the setup zone also cannot move until the kick hits the ground or a player in the landing zone or in the end zone. The returners can move at any time before or during the kickoff. Hopefully that makes sense to y'all or if some type of visual aid is on the screen so it'll make sense to y'all. Shouldn't make no sense to me. Only 22% of any kickoff at all led to any return in any way, shape or form last year. So maybe this rule will lead to us getting kickoffs back because as much as I love that Devin Hester is getting into the Hall of Fame, it hurts my heart that he's going to be the last kick returner to make it into the Hall of Fame. Maybe this rule changes it. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. But it sounds like a bunch of jargon for a rule that's going to be changed at some point again. And I kind of feel the same way about the hip drop tackle. It's going to be just too many penalties happening. A defensive player is going to end up getting hurt and defensive players end up revolting. And by like week eight, they're going to throw that rule out the window because this shit don't make no damn sense. All right. Last topic. And this one is a two parter. It's athletes gambling and the hypocrisy of the leagues and media. First up, we got John Say Porter, who I think is Michael Porter Jr.'s brother. Maybe, possibly. I don't know. According to ESPN, and who reported this story? Give me a great chance to use this new pretty graphic I made. Daniel Purdom, Brian Windhorst, and Adrian Rosarowski. On March 20th against the Sacramento Kings, Porter played just three minutes before exiting because of what the Raptors said was an illness and did not return. He did not score after attempting one shot and only had two rebounds. Sportsbooks had his over-under set at around 7.5 points and 5.5 and rebounds. The next day, DraftKings Sportsbook reported in a media release that Porter's prop bets were the number one moneymaker from the night in the NBA. Now, this is hilarious for multiple reasons. Betting on your own unders is fucking funny. It's just funny. Integrity of the game aside, it's hilarious. Like, hey, I bet you I'll play like some shit tonight. Watch me play like some shit tonight. That's funny, right? It's just funny. But also, the hypocrisy of this story that I just can't shake is, one, the NBA on League Pass, they have the betting odds on the screen as you're watching the games now. <laughs> They're on the screen. So you can literally live bet as the game is going on from the app. And as ESPN is reporting the story, as you're either you're watching it on TV or you're watching it on YouTube or you're on the website, wherever you look, there's a gambling ad somewhere around the story. So I understand why players can't gamble. Trust me, I get it. Integrity of the game. Obviously, you can't have players throwing games. I get that, right? But the hypocrisy of it, <laughs> that everybody and they mama is making money off these players yet again, except the players. Seems like it's bullshit to me. Speaking of bullshit, <laughs> this has to be one of the most, you gotta think I'm dumb or you must think we think you're dumb type stories. Shohei Otani says he never gambled on sports. This is from CNN, Elsie Hammond, and Zoe Sotley. Little excerpt. The baseball player said he first learned that his interpreter's name that I can't pronounce admitted to using money from the Stars account to bet on sports during a team meeting. Interpreter's name spoke in English during the meeting, though he didn't understand exactly what was being said. So Shohei Otani wants us to believe one of two things. One, this interpreter is a mastermind genius who was able to steal four million dollars from Shohei Otani over they've yet to clarify the amount of time that it took him to take this money four million from this man and Shohei just never noticed because that's the second story the first story was that he paid off his gambling debt at first but that sounded way too incriminating so they canceled that story and, get, and came with he's a thief so that's the Shohei wants us to believe that he's an idiot. The second part of this story is Shohei has been in America since he was 18 years old. 
according to Google, our good man Shohei Otani at this current moment is 29 years old. So 11 years he has been in the, in the United States. He still does not speak great English. He still needs a translator. So 11 years of living in this country, you still don't speak or read English well. So you need a translator to go pretty much everywhere you go, right? You'd assume. So you're telling me that this translator that you've had the entire time was able to get away from you long enough to take four million of your dollars and gamble it away at some weird illegal bookie you must think we the dumbest people on earth bro <laughs> you gotta think we stupid something is not adding up obviously i'm not sitting here and gonna outright accuse shohei otani of cheating or gambling on baseball but again, this is another part that's not adding up for me because his interpreter says he never gambled on baseball. Follow my logic here, if you will, ladies and gentlemen. If you are in the process of losing a lot of money betting on sports and you are intimately familiar with one sport, so you have an advantage in betting money on this sport because you're an interpreter for the best player in the world in baseball. So... Needless to say, you know a thing or two about baseball. So you're telling me a man that is such a gambler that he was down four million. It never crossed his mind to go to his gold mind of knowledge to put his money there. Come on, come on, bro. Like, I'm just not a stupid person. <laughs> I'm just not a dumb person. It's not adding up to me. And since California is one of like the what? 10, 15 states in the United States that don't have legalized gambling. We're gonna get an answer sooner or later. And when we do, for Shohei's sake, I hope it doesn't turn up that he was gambling on baseball and he ends up losing his career. But it's really hard for me to believe that's not that's not what the outcome of this story is gonna be, bro. Cause I'm come on, bro. Honestly, is it adding up for y'all? Is that enough for y'all? Come on now. That was fun. I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, don't forget to like, follow, subscribe at BK Beloved on all platforms, and I will see you all next week.